Hey, my name is Atan Prakash. I'm a junior here at Trinity, and I'm here today interviewing Mr. Dean Rhodes. He's the longest tenured teacher at Trinity Prep, and he's been teaching here for 43 years. And today, he's here to reflect on his career and his years. So let's get started. Okay, so let's, we can start off. What would you say were like, were some of your favorite moments at Trinity, or your greatest accomplishments? Those can be two different things. Um, one of my favorite moments, I think, was a, a senior prank done to the then senior English teacher. Uh, at that particular time in our history, there was really only one person teaching a class at a time. Mm -hmm. And they emptied his room completely and then spent a couple of weeks putting together Dixie cups, gluing them into pallets of six. And they brought these Dixie cups into his classroom, put them in the far back corner of the room, and then glued the next pallet to it and filled up both of those pallets with lake water. And they did that until the entire surface of his classroom floor was covered in Dixie cups filled with lake water. The crowning glory, of course, was the sacred elephant in the middle of that with some sort of inside joke on top that I don't recall at this point because I wasn't a member of that class. But I was, I was delighted with the effort and, and the enthusiasm with which they did this and also with the creativity that it took. The downside was that for years after, the rugs stank to high heaven because of the lake water that got spilled trying to remove it all. <laughs> That's great. So um, I guess the second part of the question, what were some of your greatest moments or accomplishments here? I think probably my greatest accomplishment was starting a speech and debate program. Um, it's really what I got into teaching to do. and. I walked onto campus and they asked me a series of questions explaining that almost all independent school teachers coach something. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, I would really like to coach a speech and debate program. And they said, well, we don't do that. But we have other things that maybe you could do. And so, you know, they, they talked about middle school swimming and they talked about middle school soccer. and. I went, uh, sure, okay, because I wanted the job. And then I spent the next three years talking to everybody and their brother about the value of a speech and debate program. And when I came onto campus, or, or when the spring rolled around and the then headmaster offered me another uh, contract, it said speech and debate. And so for a number of years, that was probably 1983. So probably until about 1990, we were basically a club. <clears throat> the uh, maximum number that I ever took to a tournament was around 20. But we had fun, they learned things. Um, I was mostly a debate coach, uh, but we did some individual events. And then my crosstown rival, Darcy Butrimus, was leaving Lake Highland, and I said, you need to come here. You are an AP US teacher who can also coach speech and debate. And she came over and I gave her the program because she really had the skill set to take us to the next level, and that's in fact what she did. So I was delighted to give way for that particular program which we then expanded to the point where we probably had 90 to 125 kids who were on the squad, and then we had a regular contingent of about 50 mm -hmm. that would go to tournaments with us. And the impact of that kind of activity, I think, is unparalleled for developing confidence in young people, because Every weekend, they go and stand before strange adults, and they talk to them, and then they get feedback on what works and what doesn't work. And as a result of that, 
they learn basically to be fearless in front of other people and to not worry about what people have to say. So that, that's probably the thing that I am most proud of here. Yeah, no, it's flourished into a great program. I think that's something to be really proud of. So in the time you've been here, I know you've worked with a lot of people, like a lot of people. Um, what were what would you say like were the qualities and people that you enjoyed working with? <laughs> I came on this campus and realized that I was never going to be the smartest person in the room. I I get to deal with a lot of really intelligent people. But the thing that I've come to understand as a teacher over the course of my time is there's lots of different ways to be smart. And there's a lot of different ways that the faculty and the administration here is smart about the way they approach people, about the way they approach problem solving, about the way they approach their disciplines. And so I think first and foremost, it's kind of the problem solving attitude that my colleagues have about the nature of what, what it is we do. The other thing is that for the most part, most days, they are tremendously caring and compassionate people. We all have our days when that may not be the case, but it's the exception rather than the rule. In other words, we try to the best of our ability to bring out, bring out the best in other people, and their compassion towards the individual struggles of specific students <clears throat> I have always found inspiring and it's caused me to change the way that I approach my teaching because I think I probably have a better connection with more students because I am sympathetic and compassionate than if I were simply demanding. Mm -hmm. I think high expectations is important but high expectations without that compassion really doesn't get you what you want because it will simply frustrate and cause people to give up. Um, the other thing that I like about them, they have a sense of humor. Uh, I think probably most faculties have a sense of playfulness about them and to the degree that we have time to get together and express that, um, I, th I think it's good about releasing stress, but it's also a way for us to get to the point where we are more trusting of one another. Um, when I have a colleague, for example, that asks for a student and I'm doing something important in class, I understand that they're not going to ask for that unless it's something really important to their program. And so I'm okay to release that student to go do that thing. Mm -hmm. So those I think are probably the qualities that I most admire about them. A little more specific with that question, I'm sure in like all these moments um, working with people, either you or them have fallen to a position where you have to take like a leadership role. What qualities do you think have you seen that like either you showed or like other people like, that worked best with this? I think one of the things that a leader tries to do is inspire a desire to emulate what it is they're doing. Um, we want to be able to show that this is something important. We want to be able to show that this is something that's doable, accessible, and we want to show people that it's in everyone's interest in order to make a stab at it to the best of our ability. Um, you know, not everyone is going to be able to rise to the occasion. Support those people. Celebrate the ones who do rise. And I think probably if you do that, I think if you recognize the people who are really rising to the occasion, and give them opportunities for sharing what they do and how they do it, um, you inspire others. And I think probably inspiring is better than using coercive methods in order to get what you want. So. 
So I guess, I mean, you, I mean, you have had a lot of time to like change and um, like grow as a person. What would you say your best qualities or strengths are today as a person and as a teacher? I hope my best qualities are compassion and patience. Mm -hmm. I hope that I can encounter each person and the individual struggles that they face and try to support them and inspire them, if you will, to want to do better. Um, I'm an English teacher. The books that I assign are not intended as light reading. They're not intended to be fun reading. They're intended to teach a certain skill set. And quite frankly, I, I've always had students who aren't interested. The, the book does not in, engage them. And yet, there's a certain skill set that I want them to attempt to get by looking at this work, by doing this assignment. And all of that is, that's the challenge of teaching. I, I don't ever want to blame a child for not performing. What I want to do is celebrate them when they do perform. And so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of giving out gold slips. And I think that's about it, <laughs> at least for this question. <laughs> Those are always nice. I've heard a lot of stories from a lot of different people about you and like funny moments and I'm sure you've seen everything. What would you say is like, you know, a couple of your funniest moments from senior pranks to everything else? Jay St. John was our third headmaster. He was, in fact, a colleague of mine. We both came in the class of 79. Um, and so he was a colleague. And he worked for many years at Trinity as one of our history teachers and one of the football coaches. And then he went off. He got a couple of graduate degrees. And he actually ended up as the headmaster of another school and then our community called him back to become our headmaster uh, after Benton Ellis retired. And shortly after he came on campus, probably September or October, a half dozen of us got together and invented a student. And we invented her name and we invented her credentials and we invented her backstory and we invented her paperwork and then we called him into a parent conference with her ostensible father ostensible father and had a conversation about how the school can best help this particular child with these particular needs and he acquitted himself beautifully as the new headmaster in this conversation. I'm, I'm sure he was probably wondering why the headmaster was invited to this particular parent conference, because that isn't a normal thing around here. Um, but afterward, um, after everything was said and done and, you know, the plan of action was determined about what this girl needed to be doing and what the faculty would do for her, etc., we carried a bottle of champagne into his office and said, gotcha. And at first he was furious. And later he came to appreciate that it was meant in a loving way, uh, that we weren't really intending to embarrass him and that he did not embarrass himself. But I love the idea that, as I think I've already said, our faculty have a sense of fun, and I, I think the most recent manifestation of that is McJimsey's bocce ball tournaments that are taking place in the quad during lunch. And I think that's a beautiful way of developing community. And I, in the same way, I think Saints, um, Saint Stops do the same thing. So anytime we can do that, uh, I think it just makes it a a happier, better place. So one, one final thing. Can you leave us with one motivational quote that's inspired you throughout the years?
I think the thing particularly coming out of the last few years, it's a quotation that I've always found deeply meaningful and, and one that I think takes on new life in our generation. At Lincoln's first inaugural, he talked about accessing the better angels of our being. And I've always taken inspiration from that because I've always took it as an obligation to search for what is the best in ourself. And I do that when evaluating my own behavior, and I do that when I'm looking at the behavior of others. I try not to judge other people. In other words, it's not my role, it's not my place. I can make an observation about whether or not something is working or not working for you, particularly if you're my student. But what that particular quotation tells me is, I have to look for the best in me and others, and that if I do that, I have a fighting chance of accomplishing most of what I want to do in a given day, so. Thank you. Thank you for that, and I wish you the best in retirement. Thank you, Atan. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful senior year. Thank you.